adjust my camera up some. Can you hear me, doctor? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. <laughs> and look, you have to please, and I'm so sorry for this, just pronounce your name for me because I don't want to slaughter it. Th well, thank you for not slaughtering it. So <laughs> my name is pronounced Afia, Afia. Billy Shaka. So Afia. Yeah, because you I'm not even gonna try to get that last name on this hour. <laughs> Afia. Perfect. That's, that's pretty. You speak a con tree from Ghana. That's where the name comes from. Or the Kiswahili version, meaning health. Oh, I love that. <laughs> look, look, Miss Afia. So how I, I thank you for joining me, first of all. And uh, so, oh yes, honey. And I love I'm loving your hair. <laughs> loving that baby loving the hair it doesn't fit into the screen i gotta bring that girl that is <laughs> that is that is beautiful so i want to what i do when i start off the show is y'all getting half of my head can y'all see me people saying they get half of my head i want y'all to see my big my big head so let's... no they gotta see the baby hairs i see them yes <laughs> do y'all got me i'm trying to get the boobs in that too it's a christian show but god didn't say we couldn't look good doctor he didn't say we can't still be sexy um so dr fia let me give you your flower sweetheart that's just a moment I, I i like to tell people why i love them so i'm gonna do the same thing with you okay so i know we just met right but i already love you <laughs> see that's how god works that's how God works. Look, all y'all telling me to adjust the camera. I think I'm good, right? I'm good. Y'all leave me alone. Okay. So, Miss Dr. Ophelia, I've been waiting to have a black psychologist on this show. Um, I'm a pro-therapy advocate, and I just feel like therapy is so important. And I'm just excited to have you today. Uh, so, I just want to say thank you for going to school to become a therapist, uh, a psychologist because we need more uh, black people in that field. And um, I'm just honored to have you on the show today, to be honest. Just honored to have you on the show today. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the invitation and even the acknowledgement that this school thing to become a psychologist took a long time. A lot <laughs> of my life that <laughs> I had to sacrifice um, to, to become a psychologist. I know you have, um, and we'll appreciate that. So let's just jump right into it. Um, we're going to have people asking us questions in the chat. And, you know, me and you are talking. We can just bring up whatever because this is our time to really dig deep. Um, so I just want to know because the question everybody or the topic everybody want to talk about is the, the issue that black people have with therapy in general. As you know, people always say black people just don't take mental health serious. So... Let's talk about that a little bit. Are we fearful of mental therapy? In your opinion, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that we don't trust it. I, I think that Black people want to feel good and have good mental health, but they also want to have good therapy, which, like mm -hmm. you were saying before, it's not a lot of Black therapists out there. So it's not always a match between the therapist and the client. Um, for Black people who aren't open to going to see a therapist, they say about 50% never go back after that first appointment. Um, mm. There's a variety of reasons. What do you think could be a reason that people don't want to go back after their first appointment, even after they try? You asking me? Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I was thinking, I don't, I, maybe, I don't know if they don't feel right talking to somebody that's not the same skin color as them. I'm hoping that someone has told them that you're supposed to try out your therapist. You don't just go and say, this is my life partner. You go and you say, let me see if this person is a good fit for me. And just like somebody in the comment is saying, I think a lot of times money may be the reason they don't go at all. But um, hopefully today we can tell them some programs and maybe something they could do when that's a factor. But I'm sorry, I'm babbling on. But yeah, that's yeah, what no, I no, think. No. But, but you brought up good points and people in the chat are bringing up good points. Yeah, there, there oftentimes has to be a cultural fit, right? And to think about the language that we use, that, you know, it's all about communication in a relationship. Any first appointment I have with a client, I tell them it's like a first date, right? It is a relationship. They're going to be telling me their deepest secrets. So they have to be able to trust me. Um, and so there's, you know, that factor, but even the money. 
So therapy is expensive. It is a financial investment. Um, it, because a lot of therapists that you would trust are out of network, meaning your um, insurance won't probably pay for it. So if you're mm -hmm. paying out of pocket therapy in like Washington, D.C., where I practice, ranges from like $150 to $200 an hour for one therapy appointment. Mm. And so just to even recognize how expensive it could be if, um, again, if it's out of network, someone who you would actually click with. Um, another factor could be, um, okay, we talked about money. We talked about trust. I'm even looking, people put patience. Um, it's not a quick fix. People can be in therapy for years. It's not like you yeah. go to one therapy session and you're like cured. It takes a lot of work. So I'm even looking, learning and discovering themselves. Like learning about yourself is not easy work. Like, cause we do a lot of um, avoidance sometimes of the things that are most painful or things that we have shame about. And so therapy, you're ultimately talking about your shameful um, parts of yourself. Like the, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't always feel good. That's exactly. I don't want to put, put a negative scope on therapy, but you're in there crying. Yes. <laughs> like talking about who hurt you, maybe who you have hurt. So oh, I know, daughter. I know. I know. <laughs> you have to. You have to put in emotional work, homework. Yes. And a lot of times, people don't want to do the work, or they just didn't want to be there in the first place. Yes. Exactly. It's a lot of emotional labor. So some, some therapists I've heard actually call it a therapy, a, um, emotional bowel movement. I know I'm getting kind mm. of graphy, graphic, but basically that there are things stuck inside of our system that we need to mm -hmm. push out. Um, and doesn't always feel good, the strain of it. But once it's out, <laughs> you feel a lot better. But, but it is a process to go through. So I think those could be factors. Again, finding the right person, being able to afford it, um, yeah, trusting the process being patient with it. Um, but again, I think black people want to feel better, but the that therapy sometimes is a little bit incompatible, right? You're going to see a stranger um, and telling them all your family background and, you know, things that you were told never tell anybody. So you're kind of going against um, how you were raised sometimes to see a therapist. Well, how can we, how can we beat that stigma when a person is just so, so against it, but we feel like they can benefit from it. Yeah, well, I think that, that it's modeling. If you ever tell anybody they need to see a therapist, you should probably see a therapist. <laughs> because I think that it's kind of showing that you're willing to try it too. Um, right, therapists see therapists. I've seen therapists. I think it's just like going to the dentist or going to the doctor or going to the gym and exercising, right? that this is a way that we have to care for ourselves and especially thinking about how critical our mental health is because our mental health impacts all our other types of health and has a relationship with it. So, yeah. <laughs> you know what you made me think about? I think a big thing we missed is it carries a lot of shame for some people. They feel like if they go to therapy, that's admitting that they somehow have faults or they somehow did something wrong. And I try to express to people that's not what it's about. It's a checkup. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's a it's self-care i think shame really is what bothers a lot of people oh absolutely that's the thing with shame it's one of the emotions that um if you don't talk about it it stays and if you do talk about it it goes away and so it has this thing but you're, you don't want to talk about it so i think that that's a factor in even unpacking some of you know the density and all the complications of our emotional world um but a lot of us therapists, I see a few sign, signing on here. Um, we talk about what you don't talk out, you act out, right? What you don't talk out, you act out. And so it's going to come up any some other way, maybe in how you eat, maybe in your relationships. Um, it's going to come up so you, you have the opportunity in therapy to talk about it instead of performing it. Okay, so you got me at the therapy appointment. What should I be looking for to say, this is my person? This is who I want to talk to. Okay, good question. I like your questions. All right. So <laughs> you better yes. Be that. Yes. Yeah, so there are so many different types of therapists. Um, so there's something called theoretical orientation. Basically, it means how does the therapy, therapist think people heal? 
how does the therapist think people heal? So there are some therapists who say you have to understand everything about your childhood experiences um, in order to feel better. So those would be therapists who are, do like psychoanalysis, psychodynamic, like a Freud sort of therapist. You've got to mm -hmm. lay down and talk about all these um, past experiences versus there are other therapists who don't want to hear anything about the past. They only want to focus mm. on what behavior you want to change. Like just, okay, you want to stop smoking? Okay, we're going to come up with a plan for you to stop smoking. They don't care how you started smoking or who smokes in your family. But even those are probably the most popular types, and that's called cognitive behavioral therapy. But yeah. you have to choose, do you want to talk all about the past and unpack things, or do you want to, like, address some current problem behaviors in your life that you want to switch up so i think that's even a factor are you are you really into talking i would say get like one of those psychoanalytic therapists versus if you want actions then it's getting the cognitive behavioral therapist because for the ones who wanted to unpack the past i had a, a supervisor once she said she was seeing her therapist for 14 years two times a week wow. 14 years two times a week and she was a therapist versus people who go to this cognitive behavioral therapist, they tend to have an average of like 15 sessions, period. Mm -hmm. So it even speaks to how long you want to work on something or how much you want to unpack. But just even like, it's personalities too, right? Because um, I know I smile and laugh in therapy, not at the clients, but I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> just trying to present like warmth versus other therapists, they say just be a blank slate. Don't express mm -hmm. any emotion. You, you're not even in the room. So I think just even understanding who you tend to get along with or the type of work you want to do could even be a factor in picking your therapist because they're going to ask you a lot of questions. Like that first appointment, they're going to ask you a lot of questions, but you should ask them a lot of questions too. Absolutely. And I, I think we kind of covered this, but I just want to make it clear to people is that it's not about being crazy. Okay, you don't have to go to therapy because you got a problem. I mean, for me, I feel like sometimes you just don't want to keep talking to your family, your friends about the same issues. They like, girl, get over that. You just want to talk to somebody who you you know you just want to space things out. You don't want to put your your problems on one person all the time. The 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 psychologists get paid to hear your problems. <laughs> so I mean, I I even joke with mine and I go look. We got five more minutes left. You about to listen to this. It, it, it ain't no getting off this phone early, getting off this virtual visit early. We're going to use this whole hour up. And me and him are tight. Yeah. Yes. Do you, you think said it, time. Yes. <laughs> Do you think it matters that the race uh, of your psychologist? Hmm. That's a good question. I do think race can matter, but it's not the only factor. Um, I'm thinking about just a shared understanding. I think that's, that's critical. Now, race can impact if you can have a shared understanding or not. But I think that, that um, race is a factor because our society is organized based on race, right? This is a race-based society. And so to recognize that there are going to be certain unsaid or implied factors that maybe cross-racial therapy might not tap into or get. But I'm mindful, like we're saying, only about 4% of psychologists are Black. So it's likely, I, I'd rather someone go to therapy and not see a Black person than not go to, like, you know what I mean? Like to say, I'm only going to see a Black person. But um, yeah, it's, it's complicated. There's a lot of research studies on it, though. But I have to throw my own advice out there, uh, Doc. And believe it or not, as as like pro black that I, as I am, and you and people know that about me who know me, I actually have a white therapist. Believe it or mm. not, and it's been days where I said to myself, "Wow, I can't believe I go in and let a a white person dissect me mentally because you would <laughs> think that I wouldn't." I mean, seriously, you would think that. I wouldn't want to do that, right? But the relationship that uh, me and my therapist has, has built is a, it's a friendship there that is, you know, professional, but I feel like he cares about me professionally, and he's an older uh, 
gentleman. And I'm always, I always been a person that respect my elders. So I just, I'm able to listen to him. And we even talk about race issues. Mm. Now I kind of tiptoed in the water to see, because even though he's a, you know, a therapist, you gotta test and, him. Right, I've had to test him to see. Okay, let me see, because I can read people a facial expressions good, and I'm like, let me see how he reacts to a little bit. So he's pretty good at taking my heat, cause I, I comment him about some stuff of, against white and black people. So I'm just telling people sometimes you got to test out your therapist a little bit if you feel like they're not comfortable. Some therapists don't want to talk. About I, I feel like some therapists may not feel comfortable about hearing about sex, even if you feel like they should hear that. You know, you just gotta. You know, see where that comfortability lies. I mean, mm -hmm. am I wrong? Or am I right? You're right. You're I mean, right. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> hey, test them out. Yeah. Yeah. And you're even bringing up something too, because it's a gender factor. Because some people prefer seeing women versus men, especially depending on the topic that they're coming in for. Let's say that someone wants to talk about a lot of sex related topics or sexual trauma, that some women might not want to see a man. Um, or even some men might not want to see a woman or even this is interesting my experience of doing therapy for the past I guess two decades at almost I find that most clients want to see a woman I, really I, yeah they they'll like men will say I only want to work with a woman and some women will say I only want to work with one I haven't had well I guess they wouldn't be seeing me right but in terms of the counseling centers I've worked at that I find it less often that they say I need to work with a man. But uh, it's, I guess it depends on the topic and personality. Yeah, it's funny because I've always felt comfortable talking to, uh, this is going to sound crazy, older men, but I mean, not in a crazy way, but I just, I just feel comfortable talking to men about issues. I feel like, I mean, to be honest with you, as long as I'm not dating the man, men listen pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I feel like men can give logical advice. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I mean, you're a good doctor. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going against women, doctor. I'm just saying for me, I, I felt more comfortable with talking to, with a man. So, Yeah, I'm even looking in the comments that sometimes people experience women as more into feelings or nurturing, right? That there's an element of therapy that is like mothering, right? Tell yes. me about, okay, you'll feel better, kind of like this um, affirming language or, you know, being being able to cry in front of someone that I think sometimes men might have challenges either way, but, you know, all based on gender socialization, right? The expectations and roles um, that we expect women to have. And, you know, it may be, too, that I'm already so close to my mother. Not that I'm not close to my dad, but I'm definitely more closer to my mother. So maybe just having that man there, it's like a, just having that special man relationship in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like that. Yep, it could be. <laughs> so let's move. Okay, so we, we, we made it to the therapy. And I want to talk about, I'm just going to skip all over the place today, but I want to talk about PTSD. Okay. Uh, post traumatic stress disorder uh i'm gonna get you to explain exactly what that is and i just one of the uh fans wanted to know or one of the viewers wanted to know uh do, do you think that it's affecting the whole country at this time yeah. ptsd all right great great question i do think that there are variations to the ways that people react to trauma some people, you know, it totally impacts their minds and their bodies. Some people just impacts their bodies. Some people just impacts their minds. Some people are not impacted. Um, a big difference between who gets the diagnosis of PTSD, which is like recurring um, thoughts and feelings and flashbacks or, you know, physical discomfort related to past traumas. Um, it all depends on what the support system looks like. That's what a lot of researchers say in terms of how soon after a traumatic experience it gets to be processed and addressed versus is it ongoing, repetitive, and you know, um, avoided. So there, there are a lot of theor theories out there, but I, I know right now I'm feeling some trauma um, mm -hmm. as a Black woman in this country. Last week, for example, hearing even the verdict um, for that they didn't arrest, you know, the cops that killed, well, there was no consequence for killing Breonna Taylor. Like, I felt tired 
Like, mm. my, I'm like, can I just go to sleep? Like, I felt so fatigued. And so I actually was seeing that as a trauma response, just wanting to rest because it was just so exhausting um, to hear the, the, the results. But um, I think that there, just even COVID, coronavirus, like I know that I've had people in my family, uh, multiple people die from mm -hmm. um, the coronavirus. So just even not having to have funerals and things like that, that I have unprocessed grief. Um, because I didn't get to be with my family. I didn't get to have the rituals that are important to closing out, you know, the relationship. I didn't get to see their body. I didn't get to, you know, hug my family. So I think that there, that collectively there are so many different um, experiences or even vicarious trauma, right? Just even watching videos, whether, you know, George Floyd or other, you know, police run over protesters mm. or, you know, all these different things that we've been viewing are, it's, it leads to vicarious trauma. So that concept that we don't even have to go through a traumatic exper experience ourselves in person, just witnessing something on your phone or the computer can actually, I think, cause PTSD. So there are so many different triggers for trauma right now that I don't think we've been able to collectively heal from because it hasn't stopped, right? So even thinking about the concept of post traumatic stress disorder there's no post there's no post it's still happening it's more so persistent right in terms of every day you kind of wake up like okay what's going to be in the news today like what happened so i'm just even thinking about that i i definitely think that we're, we're experiencing these things together well this person is asking a great question have you had an increase in therapy sessions due to the current climate with pro police brutality and COVID-19? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I have never felt so popular in my life mm. as a therapist. Um, people actually want to address their mental health and realize how significant and important it is. Um, my, yeah, I've been booked and busy. Like, I really have been booked for months. Um, it's hard to find a referral um, to get people if I can't see them. I have like one or two open slots that I still have on my website, but it's really wow. um, a lot going on. And I'm, I'm glad that people are reaching out, but it's it's kind of frustrating because they have to, right? There's not even, a, like people are not feeling well. Um, so, yeah. And you know what, the thing about, what black people have to deal with. We have to deal with cops, you know, seeing the black people being murdered, just the struggle of being black, and indirect and direct racism, which is an ongoing thing. So I know this is going to be a big question, but doctor, how can we heal a wound that is constantly reopened? <laughs> mm. But see, see, I will, I always want to be that person who can answer every question. <laughs> and but you don't got to be perfect. <laughs> but for, for that, it's we're not getting to the deeper issue. We're not mm. getting to what's causing the wound. We need to stop the thing that's causing the wound, right? Rather than just focusing on our scab, you know, healing back over. How do we stop? How do we disrupt? the thing that is attacking and harming us. I definitely feel like that we have not gotten to the root of these problems. I think for Black people in the United States, yes, we can try different techniques of self-care or other factors, but why do we have to care so hard for ourselves? There are so many factors going on a societal level or historical level or cultural level, a gender level, race level, level that needs to be addressed. Um, I think the, one of the primary problems that needs to be addressed is the legacy of trauma and slavery for black people yes. in America. It's never been addressed. No problem. generational trauma. Yeah. I don't ever remember, you know, in the emancipation proclamation that they say, okay, you all get free therapy now, like 40 therapy sessions in a mule, right? There's no, been no, <laughs> yes, there's, so been, there's been one, no redistribution of wealth right, in terms of the very foundation of this country is based on free Black labor. And to think about the relationship between um, resources and health, right, that there's constant disparities that cause a lot of our traumas, right, in terms of, you know, 
I never heard of any black owned gun company. Mm. I never heard of any black owned pharmaceutical drug company. Um, but these things, drugs and guns and these things that cause additional trauma have been, you know, placed into or forced into our communities as um, and, and causing more issues. So basically, I'm just thinking about how there, there's been a loss of group or social cohesiveness. And I think that that can even be an issue why we keep experiencing these wounds. I'm, I'm, can I talk history? I kind of like to. Can I, Girl, I can like you talk? Ahead? Can you talk <laughs> history? Girl, if you all go ahead and break some history down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm just even think, thinking about, um, you know, like you're saying, these intergenerational traumas, but, you know, the very nature of the Constitution or the Supreme Court, these were systems to maintain whites at the top and black people at the bottom. There's been no switch of that, that, ex that we historically weren't even seen as human beings, right? We're property in this country. And if you watch the debates last night, they're, these are the people who are supposed to address black issues, black trauma, black health, black wealth. Mm. There, there is, um, yeah, we, it, it would really, it would really require toppling white supremacy to be able to address black mental health. Oh, so, so doctor, I mean, to be a black psychologist in a, America, I mean, do you go into your office with a mission when you see your patients that are, I mean, I know you're going to help any patient, whatever <laughs> color, but I want to talk specifically to your black patients. Do you, do you feel you know, because you know what we talked about the stigma of going to therapy. Does that put any kind of weight on you to just try to do your best? You know what I'm trying to get at here. Like I, I, I feel very responsible for black people's mental health. And I see people who are not black, right? I just want yeah. to be clear too. Yes, of course. Um, yeah. Um but I feel a huge weight. I think I think, you know, during this whole COVID, coronavirus, you know, racial uprising, I feel like empaths like me are suffering because I feel, I feel people's pain. And so I think um, there, there definitely is a weight, a weight that I feel um, because of the responsibility, but I have to recognize that I can't carry it all myself. That's why I feel like all of us need to develop skills in uh, mental health first aid or emotional first aid. I feel like it can't be just psychologists' responsibilities to um, address these justice issues and health issues. Now, you don't you have a, a, a program about you have an emotional first aid class or something like that? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, okay. Yeah, you see, see how, you, my, my you see how plug, I throw that in there? Yeah. A little plug here. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and tell us about that. Um, so I am, okay, I am offering emotional first aid classes every Thursday of October um, at six o'clock uh, Eastern time. Basically, I don't know about you, but I don't re ever remember in school ever um, teachers, whether in health class or any class talking about depression, anxiety, like panic attacks, what to do if somebody loses a loved one. I don't ever, rem I remember kind of saying, don't get pregnant <laughs> or <laughs> yes. maybe eat healthy, but we don't actually, um, it's not infused into our educational experiences to be able to take care of our own emotional health or the emotional health of other people. So, um, you know, maybe some people take CPR classes where the you know learn to did you ever take cpr yes i did yeah. at my job yeah so a lot of jobs will require cpr or if you work with kids you have to do cpr training other things like that but we don't do it on mental health level right and to think about we're constantly in all these feelings and or emotional crises that we don't necessarily have the skill set to take care of, right what do you do if someone says they just lost a, a family member right what do you say? That's that's one of the first things people always ask. Like, what are you supposed to say if that happens? Or what do you do if someone's having a panic attack? Or what do you do after you feel like someone rejected you? What do you do after you feel like you failed at something? What do you do if you feel guilty about something you just did? 
what do you do if you you experience a loss just now so i think that to some degree there there just like there are you know people who are first responders who would do cpr we also need to do that on an emotional level for ourselves and other people so I think I think that there are very culturally specific things that black people go through, especially um, that are emotionally complex. So basically, I'm ch trying to teach people how to take care of themselves on a very specific emotional level, going through like each um, stressful emotion to, to unpack. So these classes are going to be online. It's going to be like a webinar format. Um, if you go to my website, uh, psychotherapy.org, I don't know if I should write that in there. But psychotherapy that you can register, the classes are $25 a class. It's going to be an hour long. And it's me, a therapist, going through these specific, basically, first aid kit. Because does everybody have a first aid kit in their house? I just want to make sure everybody has one. You Girl, got you know we kit. don't. Well, we got a small one. We got a small yeah, one. Yeah, we do. I thought right? about it. I had to, thought, I had to think about it. Okay. Because that's, you know, because you need to be able to, that if you get a cut, right, you clean it up. Just the same thing we need to do that on an emotional level if you get an emotional cut um to be able to clean it up and take care of it and maybe even recognize when you need to see a professional because you ever like cook something you cut yourself and you're like okay is this gonna is my finger gonna stay on or do i need to go <laughs> to an emergency room that even happens for mental health related things right that you have a medicine cabinet for physical health but to have this toolkit of when i feel this way what can I take out to help to soothe me, right? And when do I need to see a professional? Because I definitely push seeing a professional too. So I'm not saying like you could cure all your emotional pains. I think part of the class too is to say how much can you take care of yourself versus <laughs> what, at what point do you need to see a professional? Okay, well, don't worry. I will edit in all the ways people can contact you when I put this okay. up on YouTube. Follow me, Care Dangerous Talk. Okay, so let me just talk. Let me just say something real ignorant real quick, and you'll see the purpose for it. You ain't got no damn anxiety. You just need to toughen up. You ain't got no panic attack. What is a panic attack? You just need to keep your head up. Ain't no such thing as a panic attack. We ain't got time to be panicking about anything. So do, do you know where I'm getting that from? Have you heard that before? That's from yeah, you just the black me. community. <laughs> you just triggered my anxiety saying all of those <laughs> things to me, and that was just even role play. So yeah, the, the, I know I know people have been using that the term a lot lately of um, gaslighting, right? Mm. So gaslighting is a, a term um, that basically discounts the emotional pain that people are feeling. So the concept of gaslighting was based on some movie from like the 1930s where this husband was um, making his wife feel like she was crazy mm -hmm. um, by like turning down the lights and saying like, what are you talking about? I haven't been turning down the lights. And I was like, I'm sorry to laugh. <laughs> yeah, but that's the basis of the term gaslighting. And so just even, um, you know, I think that it's perpetuated in our community sometimes to minimize emotional pain right to to suck it up we're strong right we're strong black women we got this but like emotional emotional and mental health stuff we don't have necessarily choice or control all the time right that there are a lot of chemical factors there are a lot of social mm -hmm. factors where it makes it really hard to be able to control how we feel i wish i could control how i feel like that's not something like okay i'm going to be depressed today you know that that's not necessarily a choice that there are so many factors that contribute, but it's almost re-traumatizing and that gaslighting when someone tries to minimize the pain that you're experiencing. So, so I'm even saying my mom used to say, De depress my damn <laughs> house clean since you depressed. Hmm. And somebody said having a panic attack <laughs> means taking a nap. <laughs> Go take a nap. <laughs> that's not funny, but it's funny because I, I know somebody said that. Yeah, so so I think that, you know, there everything in the, the human experience has meaning to it, right? But it's the meaning that certain people place on it over others that, that can be very harmful. We need to address it. Our, our emotions are like an alarm system, right? So if your alarm system is going off, you don't just take the batteries out. You have to address what the issue is so the alarm will go off. So so I think that that because um of things like post-traumatic slave syndrome where yes. there are 
ongoing impact. So Dr. Joy DeGruy in post-traumatic slave syndrome talks about how there is ever-present anger or vacant self-esteem or um, racist socialization. And even I'm thinking about the ever-present anger that, that there's this suppression of our emotions all the time so that when we see sometimes other people in pain, we try to shut it off as a way to control how we really feel. So I'm imagining those people, mothers who were saying, go take a nap or, you know, clean my house. I'm imagining they experienced those same symptoms at some point in their life, had a panic attack or felt depressed, but didn't necessarily have the opportunity to heal from it. And so it's that, again, intergenerational um, trauma. So just to even even go and see, yeah, Dr. Joy DeGruy, yeah, watch her lectures on YouTube. She has Instagram account now. But um, to even think about how, um, again, we, we didn't necessarily have the space or the tools to be able to address our emotional needs. So I think that, that there's some uh, conflict sometimes. So I will tell you this, and I hope my parents, my parents don't have Instagram, so they can't check on me. But you say my parents will straight up say, I'm never going to therapy. I'm like, mom, dad, I'm a therapist. Like, mental health is important. They're like, nope. I'm never going to go. I'm like, really? But like, don't you trust? Like, no, like, you're like I'm not going. Yeah. So, you know, I feel funny even, you know, I don't want to discredit my parents or other parents, but there are some, um, I guess almost like these invalidations that can happen. So girl, everybody yeah. that's in their thirties, forties, twenties, have a parent, an aunt, an uncle, grandma, somebody, granddad, who don't want to go to therapy. And I like I really like therapy. Now I feel like you should have some coping skills. You shouldn't always have to depend on your therapist. And I believe in God, so I believe you should give your problems to him. But I think God has people in place that can help us. So in saying that, I just wish that we would just open up and be a little bit more vulnerable once we find our safe person, once we get comfortable with a therapist, we allow them to do their job, we allow them to be there for us. And we open up. And you're, you're not going to do anything but grow as a person. You're going to grow as a person. And you're going to be a better person for you. And just to go back, you hit on PTSS. Because a lot of people only know about PTSD. So PTSS was post-traumatic slave syndrome. And I have a good definition for it here. Hopefully I won't slaughter it. <laughs> Now, post-traumatic slave syndrome is a condition that exists as a consequence of centuries of chattel slavery followed by institutionalized racism and oppression that has resulted, uh, well, I'm, I'm slaughtering it, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. oppression have resulted in multi-generational adaptive behavior, some positive reflecting resilience and others that are harmful and destructive. So... Mm -hmm. Basically dealing with all the things we've been through in life from being so from here to there, then being so-called free, then having to deal with indirect and direct racism on the job, in the society, at the grocery store, at the gas station, everywhere. You can't turn being black off. We love being black, but sometimes we just tired. Mm -hmm. Not tired, doctor, but tired. You know what I'm see, saying. See, we I'm tried. from New York. I got. I'm, I'm from New York. I got this northern tongue, but I, I, I. So I try to say it like you, but I, I can't. But um, you, you got your ancestors with with, with the the fatigue there. Yeah. So I, 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 I'm trying to keep up with um what people are saying, but I'm I'm liking that there's so much thought that we should have yes. perspectives and opinions on this because we haven't had the opportunity to heal. It has not gone away. So I like to follow the work of um, Dr. Frances Cress Welsing. She's now an ancestor, but she yes. said that racism impacts every part of human activity. She said economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, sex, religion, war, health. So she said every dimension to which we live, there is racism. That it there's is. no escaping it. Even um, someone, James Jones, he says there's a universal context of racism, even in our minds, right, that we can't escape it sometimes. And we've internalized it at points, too. And so, and so um, Dr. Welsing says the only thing to be able to address 
um, all this racism is justice, right? We need to disrupt and destroy the system of white supremacy that, again, always puts whites at the top and black people, people of color at the bottom. Um, because until then, um, we, how, how, do you, how are you healthy? Um, so this, this, is, this is hard work. Um, the, the, it's ongoing work. But I think a big part of addressing it is understanding your culture Mm -hmm. and seeing your culture as part of your immune system, right? That your culture and practicing your culture can actually be a protective factor. Understanding the healing rituals that your family engaged in before there was slavery, before there was colonization, before Europeans, um, you know, attacked the world with some of the, these, these systems of oppression. So again, think really studying who you are, where you come from, and what were your ancestors doing to heal themselves before these processes, right? So I'm really into ancient African culture, um, or even, you don't even have to go that far back, honestly. Because even if you go back to your grandparents or great grandparents, they were doing some things to help, the, to help cope with the world and actually probably were taking better care of themselves than we do now um, in terms of eating certain foods or practicing certain spiritual systems, right? Practicing systems of tradition, um, engaging in family time, again, having community. Because have you noticed, is it me or is there like no more, like, well, not no more community, but like Black communities? I remember growing up, you could run around and ride bikes and stop by different people's houses. Like, but I don't think that even happens now. That's one of the, the consequences that we don't even trust each other. Yeah, so that, that sometimes our parents aren't our only source of support. And I think in tradition that we got used to um, having lots of aunties and uncles that could care for you and take care of you and um, that we had our own systems, right? I think one of the worst things to happen to Black people over the past 60 years, all right, I don't know how, I'm going to just say it. Um, say it. It's related to, to integration that we love. Oh, my God. I love you. I'm so glad I met you because you, look, girl, you saying everything that I've always been thinking. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, but, but right, right. One, so even thinking, okay, I see um, Brianna's talking about neighborhood family. I think even in integration then, or right, yeah, we've been integrated into Burning House. Integration is that we lost black communities, right? We lost yes. black, black doctors. We lost <laughs> black buses. We lost black banks. We lost black grocery stores. One of my favorite books um, is called Our Black Year by Maggie Anderson. Have you read that one? So basically she talks about how um, she wanted to do an experiment in Chicago where she only yeah. wanted to buy from black owned businesses for a year. I think it was 2009. And how hard it was to to only shop at black owned because we don't own anything. We don't have the resources. No. Nope. And, so, and so it becomes a real problem. Like I guess one of the factors is that when when integration happened, that people stopped, you know, leaning into and investing in black businesses. All right, yeah, exactly. That all all the black owned everything was gone so i think maybe even like 1902 there were 3,000 black owned grocery stores and at the time that she wrote this book in 2009 she said there were three in the country and so if we can't even feed ourselves like that's going to impact our survival um and connections and again that concept of social cohesiveness because i think you know people used to go and hang i think that's why barbershops and beauty salons are still a, a strong space because that's one of like our few spots that are still black owned that are safe spaces and Good i think point. that's why a lot of healing happens in those spaces now right because this is one of the few businesses that have survived um integration because people generally don't want to have other races do their hair okay who does who does your hair? is it a white guy who does your hair girl don't go there that's no, no, no. Actually, no, it's not. It's a, it's a black Latino um, male, but it, I normally like black people touching my hair. Okay, I just know earlier when we were were joking that you see um, a white male therapist, but even thinking about that, you're like, I'll let, I'll see a white therapist, but a white man's not touching my hair. Like it even has. 
<laughs> right. That, that that's part of our connectivity still, you know, our hair going to the root of it, that, that we still have that, and that even creates some of our wealth, you know, in Black communities, the, the Black hair care industry. But, yeah, I'm just thinking about how um, education even, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of integration, we used to have amazing Black schools, um, yes. that were thriving, that taught Black history, that had all Black teachers. And so I'm not saying that, that you can't learn Black information from other people, but there's a different social investment, right? Because there was a school in L.A. I don't know if you ever heard about it. Um, I think it was called Marcus Garvey in L.A. And so the, the teachers at the school um, encouraged the kids to take the SATs and like all these kids, you know, in South Central were like getting perfect scores on the SAT. And so the, the um, various educational administrators around the country were not believing that these like South Central kids um, were getting perfect scores on the SAT. So they made them take it over and over. And so, and so they kept getting these amazing scores. And so they wanted to study the school like, well, what are they doing at this school? And so the head of the school said, well, the only criteria that I have for the teachers, they don't even have to go to college. They don't have to have PhD, you know, master's degree. They don't have to have this extensive piece is that the criteria is they love black children. That's it. That's how they, they were, were learning so much. They loved black children. And so I think that that is a factor Then imagine in all these different fields that we have that the stylists love, you know, black people, the, the judges la love black people, the politicians love, imagine what a world would look like then. Um, so even thinking it's not just right about the books, it's about your love and investment in your community that is a factor in your health and wellness and education. It's a shame because I think I'm only going to get that from heaven. Like I said, I, 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 you know what I mean? I think I'm only going to get a world that loves black people as much as they love everything else that we do. Just love the essence of us as a human. That'll be when I meet God in heaven. But isn't that sad? I want to I challenge you there. What's stopping you from doing that now? What would stop you from from creating that experience for yourself or future generations? Uh, don't. Are you mean to ask me that? Or you mean yeah, to ask the oppressor? You, you, I think you should ask the oppressor that, sister. Because I don't. I don't want it, it, it. It struck me when you said that just now. Or I'm like, dang. Like I felt tingles. Like she said, she has to die in order for black people to be loved or to be be loved by other black people. So it, it just makes me. No, I, oh, I, I thought you meant by people in general. I thought you okay. meant by other races. I okay, didn't, I, I didn't. Like yeah, oh, okay. Cause I'm like, I'm about to say it was a bunch of black people who felt just like me. Remember they, they decided to dive into the ocean because they already knew that they weren't gonna have that kind of love. Um, I want to get to something because what's, what's great about you is not only are you a psychologist, you're a hairdresser. And I don't know how you put those two together, but you did it, and I like it. So <laughs> one of the questions down here is, can you explain your work around hair as it relates to psycholo psychological health and discuss the cultural pressures in relation to it? Oh, that, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of my work, I use hair as an entry point into mental health services. So I realized that hair is its own sophisticated language system that's existed for thousands and thousands of years and oftentimes used um, for medicine. And a lot of traditional African societies, our hair could represent our wealth, our marital status, our religion, all these different factors that communicates things. It even does that now in terms of our backgrounds and things like that. But when I think about when we actually get to take care of ourselves and other people, it's through that grooming process. Um, oftentimes too, uh, this is the way that we self care, right? Getting our hair done and having that opportunity to really um, invest in ourselves. And again, just, just caring for ourselves. Um, and so sometimes, beauty can motivate us to take better care of ourselves right if we're breaking out a lot maybe we'll drink more water if we you know are putting on some of the COVID-19 pounds <laughs> that will go for a walk but I think um you know that sometimes we are driven by our appearance 
And so I kind of want to latch on to that, that appearance-based motivation to actually take better care of ourselves. So some of my work includes um, training stylists and barbers, basic counseling techniques. So like I was saying earlier, that they too are already therapists, but maybe learning more evidence-based approaches mm -hmm. to how to reflect you know, statements, active listening. Um, you know, in the salon barbershop space is a lot of time where we tell stories and um, have these on informal healthcare systems. So, so I, I've been studying the psychology of hair for a few years now. Um, it was, wasn't until after I got a PhD that I went to hair school um, mm -hmm. Because I realized that was a better way for me to physically connect with Black women and men and families um, rather than them coming to my office that I realized I had to be a part of the community, part, you know, participatory healing. Um, so I hope I'm, I'm ta answering. I'm just giving all my hair stories. No, but no that's fine. I, <laughs> that's what I study. I study people's hair stories so just like history I study people's hair stories to get a sense of who they are because to some degree our hair is connected to our identity and so that's where a lot of my research and therapeutic practice is that is so true um I, I want to ask you when I always stress to people that no matter how much craziness is going on around you you have to stay sane yourself as a psychologist just tell us the importance of that. Like, let's say if, you're, if your family is just completely nuts and you're the person of reason, how can you stay sane? Mm. I mean, or, or how important is it for you to be able to pull yourself up and be okay? Mm. Well, I feel like that's a foundation for everything. Um, I have to say, I have been feeling extremely unraveled um, over the past few months, and it has been a struggle but I think almost unplugging was a way that I started to feel more of myself and more grounded um because the consequences of social media or of not getting enough fresh air and things like that that it feels so different when I actually invest in myself like I have a higher quality of life if when I first wake up I don't touch my phone because then I actually get to think for myself um, mm. or journal or stretch or drink water or have tea um, that I get a better relationship with myself so that I can relate better to other people. Um, I think a key to mental health is self-knowledge. And so we really need to know who we are in order to get the things we want or the things that we need and have satisfying lives. So that's, that's the way I think about it. I know time will be running out soon. I just want to make sure because I know it's people out there. I just, I just, I want to convince somebody today that it's okay to go to therapy. Yes, please. You know, it's okay yes. to go to therapy. You helping everybody out by going and you helping yourself out. We are healing each other. So I, I, I don't know. Do you have any, Final words while the time's kind of dwindling down here, Doctor. You would like to say, Doctor Fia? Well, I, I just really appreciate you putting this platform out there. You know, I, it's not often that that I get to sit and think about my own mental health, and so I'm um, just even thinking about how caring about therapist mental health was a really good moment for for me just now. Um, and yeah, I just want people to really invest in themselves. Um, give yourself time. Um, to really get the things that you need and you'll have a much more um, satisfying life. Engage in social justice. That's the way we can prevent further wounds. Um, and I'm not just saying that that it can be done through voting because I had some conversations about that, but actually going and doing the work, not shadow work. I think shadow, shadow work is doing something you think will help, but you don't feel good after. So even keep going and understanding what you really, really need and what Black people need and what just your communities need in terms of, of wellness. So thank you all. Dang, I, I don't know, because normally it tells me how many minutes I got left and I just, cause I got so many other things I wanted to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring up the fact, 
I'll just go till they cut us off, baby. I just want to know, how do you feel about when people say, I don't see color? And Because I, I just feel like when other races say that, I hate that. You don't see the one thing that's important to me. You don't, I mean, you know, you don't see my color when it's, mm -hmm. it, when it's, it's giving us so much trouble throughout history. Like, I feel like people say that and, and try to say it like it's supposed to be comforting. But to me, it's an insult. And I know I'm going left field, but I just want to throw that at you. Not even as a doctor, but as a black woman. How, like, how does that hit you when, when somebody says that? Are you okay with that? No. Um, I, think <laughs> <Okay>. that, <laughs> I think that it's, it's not um, acknowledging our differences, um, I think our differences are important. Um, I think that that um, it's critical that that we know who we are and discounting the way someone looks actually out, like discounts what they bring. Um, so of course, not to say, you know, stereotyping or discriminating based on color, but I think we can celebrate and honor um, our cultures and um, ranges of, of daily practices that are connected to our color. Um, yeah, that that color is the base of our interwoven bloody history during and after slavery, right? Yeah, that, that this is a race-based system. And, you know, race, even thinking about it in terms of contest, <laughs> like a race like that, that there's going to... Um, be a social construction that, that race has meaning so i don't i don't think that we can say it doesn't have meaning um it's yeah it's a way for people to say that they're not racist um and diminish exactly. you know, what we bring yeah so i was just wondering your thoughts on that because it always it always kind of it rattles me the wrong way yeah it's a microaggression yeah. It's a microaggression. In turn, it's it, it includes a, a invalidation or aggress aggressive tendency to say. And that. I tried to tell one guy who told me that I was telling him why I didn't like it, and he kept going back and forth with me. He's like, "No, I don't see race. I don't see race." And I'm like, "It was just idiotic to me." You so know, unless the idiotic. person was bl unless the person was blind, they have some issues if they can't see it. So. Yeah, if you don't see color, I bet you're not going out through the traffic when it's when it's red. I bet you're not saying you can't <laughs> see color then. So don't tell me you can't see my beautiful brown face when I walk <laughs> towards you. But anyway, Dr. Fia, I enjoyed you so much. I got I to gotta have you back on again. I got to stay in touch with something because I like your spirit. I like your smile, girl. I like, your, I like how you came back with the responses. Thank yeah, I was, I was feeling all of it. So, I, I mean, thank you so much. I finally got my episode with the Black Psychologist on. I could have talked to you all night about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you saw we had great comments coming in. So a great episode. I'm sorry to the people we didn't get to answer all the questions. But um, when you subscribe, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Fields' information up. You can go to her Instagram page. Uh, make sure you support both of, both of us. So thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. And you you be well with that lovely, beautiful hair of yours and take care. <laughs> you too. All right, sis. Bye. Bye-bye.